The timeline examination that I conducted revealed that there were actually two brain exams following the autopsy on President Kennedy's body. This was shocking. It was the clearest indication to me that, that a cover-up had occurred. The first brain exam occurred very soon after the autopsy. It occurred on Monday morning, November 25th. A photographer, John Stringer, was there at the first brain exam, and he witnessed the brain being sectioned like a piece of meat or a loaf of bread. The sections showed all the damage and were laid out on a light box so he could take photos of them. He gave his film to Dr. Humes, and he never saw it again. The reason for sectioning the brain is to show the track of a bullet in a brain that has been damaged by gunshot. John Stringer's pictures of the coronal sections of the brain never made it into the official collection and were never placed in the National Archives. The photos that are in the archives were taken at the second brain exam by an unknown Navy photographer and cannot be viewed without permission from the Kennedy family. However, Doug Horn's position on the review board granted him unprecedented access. The photographs in the archives today show no serial sections, no photographs of sections. Uh, they show both superior and basilar views. In other words, they show views taken both from above of the intact brain before it was cut and views of the intact brain taken from below of the underside and the top side of the organ. And Stringer insists that he did not take basilar views from the underneath. Photos of a damaged but nearly intact brain also fly in the face of eyewitness descriptions. Agent Frank O'Neill of the FBI stated to us that, in his estimation, over half of the mass of the brain was missing when removed at autopsy. The autopsy photographs in the collection today show a disrupted brain with the right cerebral cortex disrupted and outfolded in this direction, but they don't show anywhere near half of the mass of the brain missing. When uh, FBI agent O'Neill looked at these photographs, he said, no, this can't be. He said, this is not the brain I saw that night. He said, this is an intact brain, isn't it? He, he was asking us. In all honesty, I, I can't say that it looks like the brain that I saw, quite frankly. In the brain photos in the archives, the right cerebellum is completely intact. It's not damaged at all. And all the witnesses in Dallas who examined the wound closely recalls severe damage to the right cerebellar hemisphere of the cerebellum. Dr. Mantic was able to use the lateral x-rays to prove that the brain in the photos could not be President Kennedy's. In the back, remember, it looks very white, which suggests a lot of tissue. It's just the opposite in front here, where it looks very black, which suggests there's almost nothing but air. In fact, the optical density measurements through here shows that there's about as much tissue as there is through the maxillary sinuses, which we know are air. So how can that be? Well, that's telling us that there's just no brain in, a, in almost a fist size area up here. But here's the problem. If you look at the brain photographs and compare the photographs of the brain to the x-rays taken from the side, you have a radical inconsistency. The photographs of the brain show that the brain is intact or almost all intact here in front. How can that be? People who were present at both brain exams were Drs. Humes and Boswell. These two Navy pathologists were engaged in a charade. So we have this dichotomy then. Something done that was reality-based and another one that was to feed the fiction of the lone gunman. Clearly the government wanted the truth about what happened to President Kennedy in Dealey Plaza to be suppressed and they wanted to support the official cover story, which is that a man in a building shot a man in a car, a lone malcontent, and it had no serious political causes or overtones or repercussions. 